Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Matthias Guerrero Iris. I am a lecturer of French at Georgia State University, where I coordinate the French for International Business Program and where I supervise French lower division courses. I will be moderating our panel today with one of my students in the uh, GSU French for International Business Program, Brandon. Uh, on behalf of Culture, the Atlanta Global Studies Center, the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies, and GSU's Global Studies Program, I'd like to welcome you to GSU's Fall 2020 Global Career Series. This series features representatives from globally connected organizations to talk to students uh, and recent graduates about the rewarding opportunities that await them. This event is part of GSU's International Education Week. Today, we are delighted to bring you representatives from different organizations that teach languages. Our panelists today are Timothy Edenfield from the Japan Exchange Teaching Program, Caitlin Rowe from the Globe Academy, and Caitlin Webb from the Latin American Association. And before I turn it over to our panelists so they can introduce themselves and give you a brief introduction to their organizations, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, this session is being recorded. We ask that you please keep your microphones muted to reduce any no noise during the presentation. There will be about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So after the presentations and the discussion that I will moderate with the panelists, feel free to type your questions in the chat at any time during or after the presentations. If you're posing a question to a particular panelist, we ask that you please mention his or her name in your question. And uh, please keep in mind that we have two panelists whose first name is Caitlin. So also make sure that you indicate their last name or maybe the first letter of their last name so we know exactly who you're asking the question to. My co-moderator, Brandon, will then ask your questions to the panelists. And now I'll turn it over to our esteemed panelists. I would like to start by introducing Timothy Edenfield from the Japan Exchange Teaching Program. Timothy, welcome and thank you. Uh, could you please introduce yourself to the uh, audience and also uh, give us a brief presentation of your organization? Absolutely, um, thank you very much for having me. So hello everyone, I'm very glad I could join you today. Um, my name is Tim Edenfield. And just to give you a little introduction, uh, I'm also, uh, I attended Georgia State University and did my degree in political science. Uh, I later did my degree at Georgia Tech in international affairs. And um, I studied um, Japanese as my minor at Georgia State. Um, and a lot of my professional background is related to international education. So I was on the um, JET program from 2011 to 2014, uh, basically right after I graduated. And then I've worked in fields related to international education, um, working with international students or scholars, and also in study abroad. And then uh, currently, and since 2016, about five years now, I've been working as uh, the vice president of the JET Alumni Association of the Southeast. Um, and I, I really enjoy talking about the JET program. I'm, I'm always happy to help people um, apply and reach their, their goal. So today I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, should, we, should we go into the presentation? Sure. Okay. All right, so this one is a quick, Pechakcha presentation, that means like chit chat in Japanese. So the idea is I'll tell you just a little bit about the JET program up front, and then it will be all pictures, all photos, uh, to give you an idea of some of the things that you might experience as a JET. So if you um, want to take a quick screenshot of this on your computer, that'd be a great idea. Try to get at least the, um, the parts that are in, in uh, yellow, those addresses. Um, so the JET program is a Japanese government run program and the goal is to promote international exchange and understanding at the grassroots level. Um, it's been going for quite a while now, about over uh, 30 years now, since 1987. And there have been uh, more than 70,000 total participants making it one of the world's largest and longest running international exchange programs. Um, participants come from all over the world, but uh, mainly English speaking countries, especially in English speaking countries, and are typically, um, you know, recent college graduates are very common. We can talk about the application process a little bit. And um, the program uh, is a one year contract that can be renewed one year at a time. So it can be one year or up to five years, depending on your, your goals and um, how, you, how you find your placement and everything. 
Um, there are two main roles that you would need to know about. Um, the most common, like over 90%, is assistant language teacher. So you are not required to speak Japanese necessarily, but many do study it. And you'd be working together with a Japanese teacher of English in public schools um, to teach English, le teach English uh, lessons. There's also the CIR position, Coordinator for International Relations. Um, that one requires pretty advanced Japanese language skills. And you'd be working in maybe a town hall or some kind of government uh, entity usually. Um, and there's a wide variety of placements. It could be anywhere in Japan, and you might teach at a high school, a junior high school, elementary school, or other specialized placements. Um, I personally was mainly at a junior high school, and I also taught um, elementary school, kindergarten, and some uh, adult classes. Um, just so you know, you'll have to have a bachelor's degree, and you'll have to have U.S. citizenship in order to depart from the U.S., Unfortunately, I think permanent residents who have other citizenship are actually not eligible, but you may be able to apply through your home country. So if you have any questions especially, you know, about those matters or any others, um, please check out um, the JET desk. Their email is right here, the Consulate General of Japan in Atlanta. And then um, for other questions, I'm always happy to speak with aspiring JETs. So you can go to um, our page for the JET Alumni Association of the Southeast uh, down here. And you can find my contact information there as well. So please feel free to contact me. All right, so uh, next slide, please. The rest will go pretty quickly. I'm just gonna give you a little overview of what JET might look like for you. Of course, your mileage will vary. Our unofficial slogan is every situation is different because it is. Um, but anyway, this is me. Uh, I arrived in Chiba Prefecture, Japan at the age of 22, basically fresh out of school. So the person on the left is my predecessor from New Zealand, Jordan. And then I'm standing with my first supervisor. And then on the right is Takahashi Sensei, who I worked with for the full three years. Uh, next slide, please. OK, just to give you a, a little overview of my placement, I was in a very small town called Onjuku, Onjuku in Chiba Prefecture. I lived on the sixth floor of this uh, white building on the right in the upper left. And I lived right, right across the street from the beach. Um, my background in this photo is actually from uh, Onjuku Beach. And it has that's related to a song that was written about the beach. And now there are camels. So um, yeah, very, very interesting place. Very fun during the summer. Um, a lot of people come there from Tokyo um, just to go to the beach and everything. Lots of many, uh, many, many good memories. Next, please. Um, yeah, lots of festivals, lots of chances to hang out with other JET participants. Um, there's a fireworks festival every year in my town, and there are many other traditional ones uh, in neighboring towns. Next slide, please. Yes, so here's a couple shots of, uh, from teaching. So I was primarily at a junior high school. I worked as, uh, I co-taught English lessons there uh, four days a week. And so uh, up top are uh, some of my junior high school students, who I think are in their 20s now. Um, and then on the bottom are some of my um, elementary school students from when, when I first arrived. They're playing a Super Mario themed game. All right, next slide, please. I'll try to go pretty quickly here. I know I'm taking up time. Um, up top is some of my uh, kindergarten students from when I first arrived. Um, have a lot of great memories, uh, a lot of fun teaching kindergarten, of course. And then on the bottom is from one of our uh, dinner parties. There was a class of um, English learners as a conversation class with um, people who lived in the town who are very, uh, very kind to me. And I learned a lot from them. So very grateful to them for that. Next slide. Um, there are all kinds of English activities that you'll be involved in. One of them is an English speech contest. So for several months, I was practicing with students every day um, for to practice English speeches that they would give. And there was one year where um, all four of my students got uh, some kind of placement, some kind of prize. So I was very proud of that. Next slide, please. Um, yes, so other activities that you might be involved in. This is sports day. Um, it's, kind of, it's kind of like um, field day, but on steroids. So they have quite a few um, you know, different games and activities that they do. You can actually see our mascot down in the bottom right. His name is Ebi Amigo. He's a lobster who has a sombrero and he carries a surfboard. So he's basically my hero. He's my, my spirit animal. 
uh, next one, please. Um, you can also get involved in all kinds of activities um, at elementary school. Sometimes I could join in on art classes or something like that. Uh, a few other things, you know, there's choral performances going out on a boat. We were by the ocean, of course. Next slide. Okay, um, winter time in Japan can be a little bit lonely, it can be a little bit uh, tough. There's not a lot of insulation, uh, but so you have to learn other ways to keep warm. Yeah, that's okay if we skip the next slide. Um, so I had the opportunity to dress up as Santa Claus. Uh, had uh, It snowed a few times there. Um, let's go ahead and just jump through the next few really quickly. Uh, one time we had a surf rescue competition where people from eight different countries came to my school. And uh, we had a really cool day of activities for them and um, got to teach origami with my students uh, to the American team. Next one, please. Uh, of course, lots of friends, lots of good memories, camping. Uh, we can go to the next one, I think. Yes, so these are just various snapshots of things that I did with my friends, other English teachers, uh, local people that I knew. So St. Patrick's Day, Disneyland, ice skating, they're all there, all available. Next one, please. Um, and yes, I was fortunate enough to be pretty close to Tokyo, so I could go and see, you know, Akihabara, Sumo, Tokyo Rainbow Pride, uh, temples, Tokyo Game Show, lots of cool stuff. Next one, please. And I got to travel around Japan, so I'll just go through these real quick, but I got to go to, this is Osaka on the left, and there's Kyoto on the right, and then the one in the bottom right is near Hiroshima, uh, which is a really uh, cool experience. Next one, please. I'll try to get through the rest real quick. Uh, I also visited Okinawa, which is kind of like the Hawaii of Japan. Um, unfortunately, this castle is no longer there. It burned down recently, but um, very, very cool place to visit, a very interesting culture. And then also got to go snowboarding, see some snow monkeys. I have just a few more slides I'll, I'll jump through. Um, got to visit uh, Thailand, which is a really great experience. Um, Bangkok and some islands. Um, this is a giant Buddha from, um, I believe that was in Bangkok. Next one, please. And then my other big international trip was to Bali, Indonesia. Um, super interesting culture, highly recommend it. And um, a lot of people could speak Japanese. It was quite interesting because um, there's a lot of tourism there. So I got to see a lot of fascinating temples and yeah, one of my favorite places that I've ever been. All right, and I think this is the last one. This is just a, a scene from the end of summer at Onjuku Beach. It's normally really busy, but everyone's kind of packing up. And uh, I, I just love this photo for kind of what it represents of you know this great summer come and gone kind of thing. I think that's everything. Sorry if I took too much time. And um, um, thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, you can uh, um, ask your questions in the chat. Please mention Tim so we know you want to ask him a question. And then I'll move on to uh, Kathleen Rowe from the Globe Academy. Kathleen, could you please introduce yourself and your organization uh, briefly? Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hello, my name is Caitlin Rowe and a little bit about my background. I graduated with a degree in French from Catawba College, a small language arts school in North Carolina. From there, I participated in a teaching assistant program in France at Gif which is similar to the JET program, but in France, after which I came to Atlanta, where I have worked with Tête du Rêve Theater of the Dream, our country's only professional French language theater company, as both education director, also as executive director, and then back to education director when I started my time at the Globe Academy. While I was working with the theater, I was also teaching at the Alliance Française d'Atlanta, which is Atlanta's French language school. There is a system of Alliance Francaise schools across the entire world, which is, is really wonderful. You can go to any country and study French, almost any country. I worked there, as I said, as a teacher primarily for our youth and adolescent programs. I occasionally worked with adults in private settings. I also worked on the administrative side and coordinated our classes with corporations such as the CDC and was briefly the interim education director of the Alliance Française. 
which then brings me to my time at the Globe Academy. This is my fifth year at the Globe Academy as an elementary school teacher. I am teaching fourth grade and I am the team lead of fourth grade. And I did not, as you heard, have a traditional trajectory as far as coming into a full-time elementary school teaching position goes. I did not intend to teach full-time, but I really enjoy teaching and working with children. And after many years of the less traditional teaching route, this is where I have landed. So I'm here today to represent the Globe Academy and tell you more about our wonderful school. Here's my slide. <laughs> So the Globe Academy, Global Learning Opportunities Through Balanced Education. Next slide, please. Yes. The Globe Academy is a free public charter school in DeKalb County. It is right here in Atlanta. And we have what's called a dual language immersion program, often shortened to DLI. Our school uses a 50-50 model, so our students spend approximately half of their time in English and the other half of the time in the target language. Our school actually offers three target languages, which makes us special. We have Mandarin, Spanish, and French. I teach French to our fourth graders. Next slide, please. So you can read on your own a little bit about our mission and vision is to develop globally minded citizens who have the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to affect positive changes in our world. And just a few things I want to pull out of our mission statement there are that we do have a focus on DLI as well as a constructivist approach. We want our students to do hands-on style learning instead of just sitting there with textbooks repeating. So it gives them more opportunities to learn, to grow, and also to use the language schools that they're developing. We have approximately 1,070 students between kindergarten and eighth grade at this time. Next slide, please. Our school is, oh, upper campus disappeared, that's sad. <laughs> we do have two campuses, lower campus and upper campus. I work on the upper campus. Since we have so many students, we could no longer all fit into the same building, so we expanded. Next slide, please. Our, oh, there it is. It used to be a church, as you can see from our steeple. <laughs> all right, so our K through five students are in the DLI program that I spoke about earlier. Something that is special to our DLI model at the Globe Academy is that students really have a true, what they call an AB model, which means that they're learning all of the subjects in both languages, math, science, social studies, they'll be learning it in French and in English, not just a select number of subjects, which is sometimes the case in DLI schools. Next slide, please. When they get to middle school, our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders have the opportunity to take language for high school credit if they choose to, but otherwise they are rotating through a regular middle school schedule. They just have more advanced, um, more accelerated language learning opportunities, building off of what they have already developed as K through fifth graders. Next slide, please. So the next few slides show some pictures of our elementary school students, since I'm focusing on the DLI side of things today. So sorry, no middle school pictures. <laughs> and we have a lot of cultural activities that we incorporate into our school to celebrate not only the languages, but also the cultures. We're really proud of having many language teachers from many different countries. So for example, our French teachers are not all from France. I think I'm the exception being from an English speaking country, being a native English speaker myself, but our other French teachers are from places such as the Ivory Coast, Canada, France, they're all over the place. Same goes for our Spanish teachers and a little bit in time for our Mandarin teachers. And the next slide, you'll see a couple of our French students with one of our French teachers waving the flag at a fundraiser. It looks like our photos might pop up later or not at all. Either is fine. If they do, you'll see Plus One Davio, French April Fool's Day. And then our last slide, you will see some of our lovely little Mandarin students and you see they're learning to write 
some characters and enjoying cultural activities. So by the end of their time at the Globe Academy, they will speak, they will read, they will write, and they will be ready to go off into the world and guide their families through <laughs> countries where these languages are spoken. And that is the Globe Academy Charter School in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And again, uh, if you have questions for uh, Kathleen Rowe from the Globe Academy, uh, feel free to type your questions uh, in the chat and please mention her name, first name and last name. Uh, and finally, I'll turn uh, to Kathleen Webb from the Latin American Association. Um, good afternoon, Kathleen. Would you mind introducing yourself and presenting your organization, please? Sure, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here today. My name is Caitlin Webb. Um, I am the Adult Education Coordinator at the Latin American Association. And just to give a little bit about my background, I am a Georgia State alum. I did my undergrad at Georgia State um, in Spanish and translation. And I, when I graduated, I pretty much dove right into the adult education field. So I got my TESOL certification and I moved abroad. Um, I went to Guatemala for a little bit and taught English there and worked in a number of international nonprofits and then decided that I wanted to join the Peace Corps. So I did Peace Corps in Colombia for two and a half years. Um, my main job there was being a teacher trainer, but I worked with everyone in the community. I lived in a community about five to 700 people. So I basically worked with kids to, you know, preschool to their families in the community. Um, I did a lot of English classes and a lot of literacy work there. Um, when I came back to the States, I decided to get my master's um, in public administration. I did that in American University in Washington, D.C. And that kind of led me to where I am now at the Latin American Association. And I'm able to use both my education background and my Spanish language skills, which I really love. So next slide, please. The Latin American Association, the LAA, our mission is to empower Latinos to adapt, integrate, and thrive. And we do this through five different departments. So next slide, please. We have the Economic Empowerment Department, which is where my adult education department lies. That is comprised of adult education, Latina empowerment, employment, job training, and translations, all within one department. We also have family stabilization and well-being, which focuses a lot on financial assistance, rental assistance, bill assistance. There's a domestic violence program within that department. We have a youth services department, which does a lot of mentorships and works on college readiness, civic engagement and advocacy, and immigration services. Next slide, please. So this is my uh, passion, the adult education department. We have ESL, Spanish, computer literacy classes, and we also provide teacher workshops. So these workshops are free for ESL teachers in any organization. Um, we talk about best practices and novelties in the field. So that has been really interesting to meet a lot of different people and, and to be able to learn a lot through those. We do in-person and online classes right now during the pandemic. Uh, obviously everything changed for everybody. We brought in an online program that had not been there before. And while there have been a lot of barriers, we have seen a lot of good come from it because we've been able to reach all across Georgia and even out of the country. We have students from other countries taking our English classes, which I think is really wonderful. And during the pandemic, uh, just in ESL alone, we were able to serve a thousand students last year. So that was really great. Um, we're always looking for new talent, especially for in-person teachers, because there's a really big push to come back and we, we really want to be able to serve our students in that way. So if you um, or anyone you know is looking to, to start teaching, definitely take my email address down. Um, you'll see it on the screen. Um, please send me any questions that you have. Um, and our website is also there if you want to look into any of our other programs. Thank you very much, Kathleen, and uh, thank you for sharing your uh, email address as well. So it's good to know that if we don't have time to go over all the questions today, they can uh, members of the audience can reach out to you. That's uh, great to know. Thank you. So uh, thank you to the three of you for giving us uh, a snapshot of your organizations and also for sharing your your professional journey and uh, and some of your beautiful travel pictures as well from you know from Japan. And uh, thank you. Uh, this was really really informative and really interesting. So um, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to ask you a few questions and then I wanna keep at least 20 minutes for uh, to address the questions from the audience. 
Um, this is also a reminder that you can ask questions in the chat. Please uh, mention the name of the panelist you're asking the question to so we know exactly um, 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 which person we need to uh, ask this question to. So I'd like to ask a first question to uh, Caitlin Rowe from the Globe Academy, and I will keep my questions short uh, in the interest of time. Um, Caitlin, could you tell us more about the skills that you have learned in your professional life that have been vital to opening career opportunities for, for you? Yes, as I mentioned in my spiel about myself, I did not come to full-time teaching the usual way in terms of getting certification in college or studying education specifically in college, but I did go straight into a teaching assistant program in France. And while I was there, they did provide us with teacher training. And I really learned on the job. I was in a very, very small town called Gray. It is <laughs> in the eastern side of France. And I was really in charge of all of my classes of primary school students teaching them English while I was there. So by the time I came back to the United States the following year, I had the skills available to me to teach in a classroom, to change how I was teaching in terms of whether or not students were understanding, whether they had different needs. And I was able to put that into action almost immediately working at the Alliance Francaise because they were looking for a summer camp teacher. And I was in the right place with the right skills at the right time. And I continued to grow my skills as a language teacher while I was at the Alliance Francaise through professional development opportunities and then brought those with me to the Globe Academy. On the other side, I developed skills in budgeting and management while I was working as education and then executive director at Théâtre du Rêve. And I actually, I use my budget skills currently as a grade level chair. So you never know what pieces and um, parts of the puzzle you're going to obtain as you go through your journey. Anything that you do or learn might be very valuable to you later on. So don't take anything for granted. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin. And uh, I would love to hear more about your experience in, in, in France, being from France myself, but we don't have time and I have a million questions for you. Uh, so if um, participants have questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. And uh, speaking of living abroad, this is a good transition to my next question for Caitlin Webb uh, from the Latin American Association. Uh, Caitlin, do you think that uh, in order to teach a language um, that it's necessary to spend time abroad and have experience of being immersed in another culture? So I don't want to say that it's necessary to spend time abroad because that's not a possibility for everyone, right? I think it is very important to interact with other cultures and to put yourself in a position where perhaps you are learning a language or you are not comfortable with the situation because that's what you're going to see in your classes. Um, learning a language is really hard. It can be really stressful. And so I feel like you do need to have that experience um, in order to have empathy for your students and to be able to put yourself in their shoes. That being said, I think we're in a great location for you to be able to find that domestically, right? So you can take classes you can put yourself in situations. I mean, we have cultures from all over the world here. So I think having that experience is vital, but I don't necessarily think you have to go abroad to get it. Well, that's that's great to know. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, then I'll, uh, I would like to ask Tim one, uh, one question. Um, Tim from the Japan Exchange Teaching Program. Um, Tim, did you ever experience culture shock, uh, for example, when you were in Japan? And um, could you describe your, your memory of it, of, of your cultural shock? And um, what did it teach you? Uh, yeah, so this is actually, um, I think it's hard to avoid in going to Japan and not having some amount of culture shock because it's going to be very different from what you're used to. Um, there's the language difference, there's cultural differences the way that people communicate, like even if you understand what people are saying, sometimes you don't understand like the subtext because in, in Japan, things are very implied. It's often not said explicitly. 
So when I first got to Japan, um, I actually had a pretty hard experience, my uh, hard time my first few months because uh, it was a lot of firsts for me. It was my first full-time job, first time living abroad, first time teaching, and I was teaching all these different levels. So some of it was cultural um, in nature, you know, culture shock, and some of it was just total overwhelm. <laughs> um, but I did manage to work through it over time. Um, yeah, so if you're going to go somewhere that's very distant from, say, US culture like Japan, um, you really have to go in with an open mind and, and just expect that you will have some period of adjustment. Um, I, have a, I actually present on this topic quite a bit for um, departing jets. And um, let's see, some, some general advice to give. I mean, basically, it's different for each person, but you may experience some amount of anxiety or you're just kind of overwhelmed, you're fatigued. Um, you may, you know, become like socially withdrawn or only associate with other foreigners. Like there's usually, uh, a, there's, there's kind of, a, I'll just wrap up with it. There's a four part model of culture shock that's commonly used. So um, first is stage one is euphoria. You're, you're pumped, you're in a new place, everything's interesting. Then there's usually a crash that's called stage two. That can be different for every person. I definitely had um, a crash and um, but you also can, you go through stage three, which is more like gradual adjustments, and stage four is when you're fully adjusted, you can operate in two cultures comfortably, and that may take a while, and you actually may go through a, a cycle like that uh, quite a few times, like, like each year, so I'd say it, it never really stopped in some ways, I always felt like I was experiencing culture shock, but um, I was a lot more comfortable and a lot more able to function after I got settled in initially. So don't give up. Uh, if you go to Japan, expect some culture shock, but you absolutely can power through it and it's worth it. Thank you, Tim, for sharing your experience. I'm like, a, like, a, like I said earlier, I'm from France and I feel like I'm still experiencing culture shocks uh, mm -hmm. after seven years in the US. So oh, see, wow. it, it never stops, but um, you get used to the, new, to, to the, the host culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we have a few minutes left for our discussion. I see that we have a few questions in the chat and Brandon will address these questions in a, a few, few minutes. Um, my next question is for, um, it's a general question for the three of you. Um, what are the tangible steps that students can take wh while still in college? I'm assuming most of our participants in the audience are still in college. Uh, what can they do to improve their chances of landing a position in your organization or in your program? So, uh, Caitlin Webb, would you would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think just being seen in the organization. I have wanted to work at the Latin American Association since I was in college, and so uh, I constantly reached out for volunteer opportunities. I did literally everything possible. I, I helped during Christmas. You know, I was a volunteer ESL teacher um, with the program as well. So I think just making yourself known and reaching out to people. I mean, this is a great step. You're here talking to representatives from the organizations. You have our emails. So just let your interest be known and, and try and volunteer for whatever you can. Absolutely. I agree with that. And this is a uh a great opportunity that you're sharing your contact information with, with students in the audience so they can reach out to you and, and like you said, be seen. Uh, um, who, anybody else wants to chime in and uh, yes. tell us about the steps that students can take, Caitlin? Yeah. Yes, of course, if you're somebody who already knows that education is what you want to pursue, taking education classes while you're still in college alongside your language classes would be a wonderful step, but it's okay if that decision comes to you later on as well. I will say for those of you who already know, education is where you want to go. Take the time to explore the different areas of education. At the Globe Academy, we do often have student teachers or we'll have a college student come in and volunteer with one of our language teachers for a time. And that gives you an opportunity not only to be seen by the teachers and the administration, but also to see for yourself what it's like to actually be in a classroom. And because I worked there for so many years, I have to say that Alliance Francaise does also always seek wonderful interns. And just as Caitlin Webb was saying, that's a wonderful way to get to know an organization and have them get to know you as well. Wonderful. Thanks, Caitlin. Tim, would you like to uh, add anything? 
Sure. Um, so to those of you who are interested in the JET program or interested in going to Japan, um, one of the most important things that uh, we look for when we are interviewing applicants is that you have a demonstrated interest in Japan. When I say demonstrated, I don't just mean like, oh, I love anime, I love video games. I don't recommend mentioning that, although that's fine. Um, but really, it's about like, you know, what can you show? What can you show that you've done that shows that you're serious about learning about Japan? So um, taking Japanese classes is a great, great idea um, if you're still in school and you have time. Um, other things that you can do are get involved in um, clubs that are related to Japan or Japanese. Um, any, anything that you can put down on paper as being like a serious thing that you've been involved in. Um, you can also intern for organizations like the Japan America Society of Georgia. Um, and there are other Japanese companies where you could um, potentially intern or do something like that. Um, it's really up to you. It doesn't have to be super, super formal. It could be that you're part of like a judo club or something like that. Um, just anything to show that you're serious about Japan, about you wanting to learn about the culture. And it's not just like a one year vacation to, you know, go to anime related things or something, but that you really have a, a deep interest in the country will, will be most helpful. Great. Thanks, Tim. That, that is very helpful and good to know. Uh, um, so we have about we have about 20 minutes left, so I want to make sure that we address uh, questions that were asked in the chat and feel free to post more questions. Um, and if we have some time left at the end, I will ask you a few more questions because I have about a million questions for you, uh, for you guys. Um, so I will uh, let Brendan, my co-moderator, uh, go over the questions uh, in the chat in the order in which they were received. Right. So starting off with the JET program still, uh, James Stamps was wondering if the JET program was geared towards the youth college age students or whether there's an age limit or not for the program. Uh, yes, so this this is a good question. I, I typed a message to James directly, but I wanted to uh, share with the group as well. Um, so my understanding is that there's not a formal limit um, on your age, but it is most most often it would be recent college graduates like people in their 20s or maybe 30s. Um, I think in their language, it says something like in principle, they would like you to be under 40 or 45. But um, it is certainly possible if you're an older applicant, um, you can you can certainly still apply. Um, I think you would just want to spend some time um, building up your demonstrated interest in Japan. And maybe you could think about how you would talk about how um, going on the JET program would fit in with your current goals, whether you're um, uh, in, in college now, or if you're planning to return and continue a career, you could, you could just think ahead about how you would talk about how this would fit into your life. Um, and it's certainly possible. Um, I, I know that there are um, JETs who, who, who go from that age group. Um, but just to give you like a general um, bit of feedback, I think it can be a, a little bit more challenging. So you just want to think about how you would frame your interest in Japan. Thank you. We also have a question from Ms. Webb from Osiris Zolea. They're wondering if it would be possible to volunteer or intern even if they're not a trained professional. Yeah, um, so the idea is that we have uh, ESL classes happening all the time. And the idea is that any volunteer just be an asset to the teacher, right? To not be more work. So as long as you have an interest in this and you're willing to participate and have a commitment to the classes, we don't want people coming in and out randomly. We want someone that says, hey, I'm willing to be there every class until the end of the session. We definitely take all that into consideration. So absolutely. And then I think there was another question about volunteering just in general with our with my organization, um, all of our departments allow for interns and volunteers. Um, and so if anyone wants to send me their resume and just say, you know, hey, I'm interested in this department, whether it be my department in adult education or any of the others that I listed, please feel free to do so. Thank you. We actually have another question for you uh, from Kayla Blake, who asks if you have jobs or intern positions that focus on background support or if it's primarily focused on teaching positions. Right. And again, so like that depends on the department. So in the youth department, perhaps you can work with the mentor team um, in whatever they need. Or if, um, you know, in the family well-being 
cooking department, you might be able to work in the food pantry and things like that. So it just depends on what the department needs at the time. Um, in my particular department, adult education, obviously it's more of a, a teaching situation because that's what we do. Um, but there's always like admin support, you know, making phone calls, uh, you know, doing attendance and things like that that really help our program as well. So it just depends on what each department might need at the time. Thank you for that. For Ms. Rowe, uh, or Sirs, as Leia also asked, if what or what would be the a way or contact to sign up with the Globe Academy and if there are requirements to sign up? Yes, our language coordinator's name is Sandra Daniel. I can put her email in the chat box for you in a moment since I'm not good at multitasking. And she would be the one to reach out to if any of you have any interest in volunteering or if you're a student who is working towards an education diploma at this time, contacting her in regards to student teaching positions that might be possible in language classes as well. And in terms of requirements, of course, knowing the language. So making sure you're taking those advanced and intermediate high level classes in college. Thank you. Uh, for Tim, going back to the JET program, we have a question from Chloe Deline, who is wondering if the JET program can be used as something more permanent or if it's strictly temporary as a job. Okay, um, so this is a great question. So the JET program itself is going to be strictly temporary, but it's a one-year contract that can be renewed up to five years total, so one year at a time. So um, it, it, that's a big chunk of your life, right, if you decide to stay for five years, so that's certainly possible. Um, but at the end of the day, it is um, temporary. That, that is the limit. Occasionally, people get hired directly outside of the JET program by the same school, but that's not very common. So you should expect that your time as a JET will definitely be temporary, whether it's one to five years. But if you have an interest in living in Japan uh, long term outside of JET, fantastic way to get there and to um, continue doing something else if you'd like. So the JET program has been around for like 30 years now, and it used to be that they wanted people to come, have a great experience, and then go back home and talk about Japan. But over time, I think they realized that there's a lot of benefit in bringing people to Japan who want to live there long term. Um, and they can start with the JET program and still promote those goals of internationalization in Japan. So I was in Shiba Prefecture, not too far from Tokyo. So in my case, I'd say like maybe a third even, of the jets that I knew actually stayed on in Japan and they could get a job in Tokyo during some doing something, depending on what their skills were. Um, so if you happen to be near a larger city, there's lots of um, private teaching opportunities and depending on what your skills and background are, um, there, there are lots of international companies in Japan, you just want to do research ahead of time and you can use your time as a jet to learn about and contact people do informational interviews. Um, so that you can kind of plan for um, staying on after, which is certainly possible, but you would just need to um, think about that in advance and work out things with immigration and visas and that kind of thing. Thank you. <laughs> there are no more questions from what I can see as of right now. Chloe said thank you for that too. <laughs> of course. Sure, no, no problem. We, um, we have about we have about 15 minutes left, so we can, um, I can, uh, we can give the audience the opportunity to think about the questions they want to ask for a little bit, and I can ask you a few questions, and then we go back to uh, the Q&A with the audience. That's, that's no problem. So um, my next question for you is, what is the most rewarding aspect of your, of your job, of your current position in your current organization? And uh, so, Tim, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I think that one of the greatest things about being on the JET program is that there's a huge JET alumni community. And so when you go on the JET program, you have this one to five year teaching experience, but you also have this massive global network, basically, from, from it being such a well-established program, from people who either recently or less recently um, were, were jets and, and now are moving up in different, uh, in different fields. And so I think one of the best things is that you have the, the chance to contribute and give back a little bit to keep the program going strong because it's really not just about teaching. Um, really the, the 
area where the JET program is much more impactful is on the cultural side, on sort of the exchange side. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, getting involved in the alumni community and being able to support people who are aspiring JETs now or people who are about to go on JET, um, it really helps us to share our experiences and what we learn so that they can have a good experience and make you know a positive contribution and then hopefully come back into the alumni community, whatever they happen to be doing in the future, and they can help other people get that start uh, in whatever fields um, they're working in. Great, thanks, Tim. Kathleen, Kathleen, anything? Um, go ahead. <laughs> I just think, um, so I'm the coordinator of the program, but I also teach in the ESL program and being able to see the progress of my students is amazing. I love it. Um, I really focus in my classes on giving them phrases and tools and tricks that they can use in their everyday life. And even just small things like teaching someone how to ask for repetition, like, can you repeat that, please? I had a student <laughs> come to class and say, I went to the dentist and they talked to me about, you know, 300 miles an hour. And I was able to say, can you repeat that, please? And then I understood what they said and she was so excited. And so just being able to, to see that that little progress in your students for me is the most amazing thing. I agree. I am a language instructor myself, and this is, I think, by far the most rewarding aspect of my job. It's uh, to see students produce the language um, and see the, the progress is simply incredible. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Kathleen Rowe from Globe Academy. Would you like yes. to uh, add anything? Mm -hmm. Exactly what you both just said. And then I think there's an extra aspect that's special when you're teaching in a dual language immersion environment. These kids are on a very unique path to learning a language. And it's not a path where their grammar is being corrected all the time or their spelling is being corrected all the time because you just want them to be producing something akin to the language and watching their journey and seeing them, you know, by the time they come to fourth grade and fifth grade, have conversations about current events in the world or social issues or science concepts in a second language. And even those students who are lower in the language, you see the wheels turning as they take the vocabulary that you've practiced and work to apply it to these bigger ideas. It's just, it's fascinating and it's exciting. And then when they get excited about it and they're ready to learn more and they tell you that they want to keep learning the language as they get older, that's a very rewarding moment. It sounds fascinating. I'm, I'm jealous that you get to teach in such an incredible environment. Well, I teach in an incredible environment myself, but it, you're right, dual immersion is, uh, is I, I've, I, I've, like I've told you before, I've visited the Globe Academy and I, and I saw uh, the, the work that you guys do there. It's, it's incredible. Um, let me look at the chat, make sure that we don't have more questions from the audience. Uh, I think we have a couple of questions, Brendan. All right, so we did have one question from Crystal, which was answered by Diana, but just in case everyone didn't hear it, the YouTube recordings are in the chat right now, so in case you need to access them. Um, and then we have a question for all three of you from Deanna Renrap, who is asking what the pay or stipend for the JET program, entry level positions for LLA, or the starting salary for DLI teachers are. So if you want to answer them, starting from Tim going up to Ms. Rowe. Uh, sure. So um, the best way to find out is to go to the um, JET Program USA website. I, I think it's jetprogramusa.org. You may have to Google it or it's on the, the first slide that we had. Um, it's a little bit different now than when I was there. Um, it used to be that there was a set salary that didn't change for the whole time. Now you start out a little bit lower, but then you get a raise each year that you stay. So you can actually make more total if you stay for five years. But um, so it, it's, it's, you'll be paid in yen, Japanese yen. So it's three, uh, 3 million yen per year, which is I think about like a little over $30,000. Um, but like I said, that, that bumps up, uh, I forget the exact amount, but it bumps up every single year um, that you continue to stay. They uh, reworked it to encourage people to recontract and to um, 
um, reward those ALTs that have been there for a long time and, and really are you know doing well in their jobs. So three uh, three million yen is the answer. Um, it's definitely a good salary for um, being fresh out of school. Um, it's definitely um, enough to live on certainly and travel and everything. And it's very common for jets to have um, subsidized housing of some kind or even free housing. Um, I only paid like $250 for like a two bedroom apartment um, because the other half was paid for. And then some people, if you're in the countryside, you may get a house. I mean, they may have a house where you can stay for free. Um, so it may not sound like a ton of money, but you're likely to be um, pretty comfortable and pretty well taken care of in most cases. Yeah, and just speaking to the LAA, I, I can't speak to other entry level positions. I can only uh, speak to the positions I hire for, which are instructors. Um, and we have a range uh, from 18 to 24 an hour, and that's dependent upon experience and education. We also pay a little bit for planning because I understand as a teacher myself, it's not just showing up to class. There is time <laughs> that you spend beforehand planning your classes. Um, we offer corporate classes in both our Spanish and English programs and private classes. And so those will pay a little bit more as well. But for the group classes, um, like I said, it's 18 to 24 um, plus planning. And as far as teaching is concerned, that's something that varies from county to county, from state to state, between public and private so very widely. <laughs> but in DeKalb County for public school, it's in the mid 40,000s for somebody just starting out. And then it changes after every so many years. It changes if you get a master's degree, if you have special certifications such as for gifted, such as English for speakers of other languages and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. And then continuing with this row, um, E.B. asked if you know of any conversation groups for or with Francophone Africans. I am not currently aware of any. That sounds like a wonderful conversation group. My, my personal conversation group was always just my colleagues at the Alliance Francaise who were from African French speaking countries. But uh, there's a lovely general Francophone Facebook group called Frenchie of Atlanta you can look into. And if you asked on there, hey, does anyone know of a, <laughs> of a group with this type of individual? I imagine somebody would point you in the right direction or possibly just reach out and start one with you. <laughs> and then for Tim, we have a question, another question from Chloe. If she or he does go to the JET program, would they be allowed to bring um, their partner to live along with them if they don't want to be in the program? Okay, um, that's a great question. So um, the answer is basically, if you are married, legally married in the US, then yes, um, you can definitely um, bring your partner or spouse. Um, that's for visa reasons. So if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend that you'd like to bring with you, um, it may be a little bit more complicated. I think that if you both apply to the program, they may try to place you in the same area, but really to guarantee that um, they can come and that they'll, they'll accommodate you knowing that you have someone coming with you, um, you would need to be married. So depending on that, um, you would probably want to contact the um, Japanese consulate if you were thinking about um, wanting to go with a partner who you're not married to because they would have to basically figure something else out, I think. Um, but if you're married, then then yes, absolutely. And that's that's not uncommon. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> and I think that is all the questions I have received. Yeah, I think uh, I think we've addressed all questions for the audience. Thank you, uh, Brandon. Uh, if you have more uh, questions, we have a few minutes left, and I've also posted the the link for the Facebook group uh, that Caitlin Rowe mentioned, uh, Frenchie at Atlanta. Uh, it's a great group and they always do, uh, I mean, in a normal time, they usually do a lot of meetups, uh, but this is pandemic time. And well, actually, good transition for my last question. Um, I was wondering how has the pandemic impacted your organization? Um, and that will be, I think, my last question. Um, and uh, so how has the, the COVID-19 affected your workplace and the nature of your work? Uh, Caitlin uh, Webb, would you like to uh, chime in uh, and tell us more about this? Sure. 
Um, I mentioned briefly in my introduction that before the pandemic, we had no online really presence. Um, and so we had to create that <laughs> like right away. Um, and there have been a lot of barriers, I think has opened our eyes to the amount of people that don't have access to technology or internet or don't have the skills to be able to use that and access our programs that way. Um, and so that has been tough and we've been working a lot on ways to, to, to teach people that. So we've you know, changed our programming within our computer literacy program. We have had to teach people how to use Zoom so that they can access our ESL classes when that wasn't necessary beforehand. Um, so it's been a struggle, uh, but it also has been really great because again, we've been able to expand our reach. So people that weren't able to come to classes beforehand because of, you know, no transportation or their physical location in Georgia, um, you know, they've been able to receive services, not only in my department, but in other departments as well. And so that has been really, really great for us. Yeah, it's uh, it's had it has been challenging for us too at Georgia State University, but we're, I feel like we're learning, we're learning so much as well, uh, and changing the ways in which we we work as uh, educators. So it's uh, there's always a learning experience somehow. Uh, in the last few minutes that we have, uh, Caitlin, Tim, would you like to um, tell us a little bit about how the pandemic has impacted your 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 work environment in a positive or negative way. I know everyone's heard a lot about schools being impacted by the pandemic. And I mean, so much of it really is what you hear. It's It's been hard for teachers and for students and for administrators, especially when everything first shut down, we had to transition very, very quickly to teaching completely virtually. And not everyone had the means to do that. Different teachers had different comfort levels using technology. I was fortunate in that I had already been using Google Classroom with my students, so they had some familiarity with it already when we went completely virtual. And then we spent last school year at our school completely virtual until about mid-March when we had a hybrid version. So we were teaching simultaneously to students who were on our computer and like projected, I have like three screens now in my, in my classroom. It's wild, it's wonderful, but wild. And they were there on the screen and they were there in the classroom and I had a microphone set up and a camera set up and we danced around it and talked to each other that way. And of course, masks all the time here. I'm closed off in a tiny place with nobody else, which is the only reason I'm able not to have it on right now. Um, but it's been interesting and challenging watching our students transition to coming back to being in the classroom, to navigating social situations. Our counselors have had a lot on their hands and the teachers have been stepping in as much as we can to try to help navigate all of everything that continues to go on. But we're grateful that our younger students are finally able to receive the vaccination and we're waiting to find out what that will mean for the next changes that will take place in our protocol. Thanks, Caitlin. Tim? Sure, sure. Um, so it's an interesting time um, to be involved with an exchange program right now because of COVID-19, of course. So um, just to give you some ideas of how it's impacted the JET program, um, I felt really, really sorry for the 2020 JETs who are supposed to go in 2020. They got delayed by almost a year. And then the 2021 JETs got delayed several months recently. So they all just recently left. Um, and I guess it, I'll repeat that every situation is different. And, um, you know, the, the Japanese government runs the JET program, but then you would be working for local boards of education, local schools. So every school is going to be different. So some, some are doing remote teaching, like by video or something, but that's actually not, it doesn't seem to be as common in Japan. Um, on the other hand, wearing masks is just a normal thing when you're sick or even when it's like flu season in Japan. So getting kids to wear masks is not as hard there. Um, but from what I've heard, most of the, um, the schools are still teaching in person. So there's, you know, some anxiety, some risk. Um, vaccination rates are not nearly as high in Japan, I think due to um, vaccine availability. Um, and so I think everyone's a little bit, you know, antsy right now. They don't really know how it's, um, how it's gonna be, but for us at the JET Alumni Association of the Southeast, 
Um, we did, for example, our pre-departure orientation was all online this year over Zoom like this. Um, so we would normally do that in person over a couple of days, but instead it was spread out in the evening over like 10 days and we, we talked to the 2020 and 2021 Jets. And then the other thing that I felt sorry for them about was um, they have to quarantine in Tokyo when they, when they arrive. So um, I think that the JET program is paying for it, but they were going to be stuck in a hotel, from what I understand, for like two full weeks when they first arrive in a foreign country. So I can only imagine how surreal <laughs> that would be. Um, but, you know, they worked, they, they worked a lot. You know, they did, they did a lot to be able to go. So I think they'll get through it just fine. And, um, you know, it's, it's a unique, strange time, but I think for the most part, uh, people are doing okay. Just a little nervous. Yeah, thanks, Tim. And I didn't mean to. Now I'm thinking I didn't. I didn't mean to end this panel with such a negative question. But it's <laughs> great to. It's great to see that the world goes on, and our careers and our jobs go on, and life continues, and we're adapting, and we'll continue adapting for a little while. So um, uh, I'm glad that I had time to ask this question. I think it's an important one, uh, and it is. I see that it is two thirty. Unfortunately. We are um, at the end of this uh, panel. So I would like to thank uh, again, uh, Timothy Edenfield from the JET program, uh, Caitlin Roth from the uh, Globe Academy and Caitlin Webb from the Latin American Association. Thank you for uh, sharing your time, your experience, your expertise uh, with us today. Uh, we learned a lot and we appreciate your tips and advice for our current and future uh, job seekers. We uh, want to thank you all for participating in the GSU Global Career Series. Thank you also to uh, Brandon, Mike, who helped me uh, co-moderating this uh, panel. And finally, I'd like to thank the audience members for attending this session and also asking great, great questions. If you have more questions, feel free to reach out to the panelists directly. We hope you enjoyed it. And this is the end of the fall 2021 Global Career Series, but please stay tuned for another series in the spring. Finally, I'd like to thank the Atlanta Global Studies Center, the Center for Urban Language Teaching and Research, the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies and the Global Studies Program for organizing this series. All Global Career Series videos can be found on the YouTube channel. And I believe we have the link in the chat. So thank you again to all of you and have a wonderful weekend and please stay safe. Goodbye. Au revoir. Thank you so much. Thank you.